The next topic in Chapter 7 is Subsidiary Ledgers. Subsidiary ledgers are an added step onto the accounting system, so it's nice they come in the chapter where we add special journals and introduce such a great shortcut. I'd like to bring down two accounts out of our general ledger now, make them a little bigger, and look at them. An asset, accounts receivable, I'd like to bring it down out of our general ledger and look at it. And the liability, accounts payable, also brought down from the general ledger so we can look at it. When you have sub-ledgers, you are attempting to keep track of the balance in the accounts receivable account by individual customer and the balance in the accounts payable account by individual vendor. Let's start with looking at what happens in accounts receivable and assume you have three customers, customer A, customer B, and customer C. You have a record of credit sales in the sales journal and these are entered in total in the accounts receivable journal at the end of the month. During the course of the month as transactions are happening they're being entered into the sales journal and as they're being entered into the sales journal they'll also be entered into the accounts receivable sub-ledger. 
Let's assume in your cells journal you have three cells listed in chronological order. The first cell that you had listed in your cells journal is to customer A and it was for a hundred dollars. The second cell in your cells journal was to customer B for two hundred dollars and the third cell was to customer C for five hundred dollars. And that was all the cells you had for the month. You could expect that your sales journal would total 500 plus 200 plus 100, 5, 7, 800 dollars. And at the end of the month, when you posted the total from the sales journal, you would go into accounts receivable and post 800 dollars. Because at the end of the month, you would post the total from the sales journal. During the course of the month, as the sales journal was being completed, you added amounts to the accounts receivable. The rule is, if you post everything in the sales journal as the month progresses into the accounts receivable subledger, that the sum of the individual debits in the subledger will equal the total you post into the general ledger account at the end of the month. And in our case it does. Each day we total we posted the individual activity and at the end of the month we totaled the subledger and posted its activity. The other journal that affects the accounts receivable subledger is the cash receipts journal. Let's assume that during the cash receipt the month we received seven hundred dollars in cash receipts. Each day as we recorded them into the cash receipts journal we would update the subledger. So, maybe on the first day, customer C paid us $500, and later in the month, customer B paid us $200, the total of $700. We would post that as the month progresses, keeping track of that in the cash receipts journal, and then at the end of the month, we would post the totals of the accounts receivable. One of those totals would be to go to the accounts receivable account, and post a total of $700 payment coming in from the cash receipts journal. Notice now the balance in accounts receivable at the end of the month. 100 debit balance. If you follow the posting rules that the debits in the subledger equal the debit in the control account and the credits in the subledger equal the credit in the control account, then it would hold that the balance in the individual customer accounts would equal the balance in the control account. And you could actually make an accounts receivable list. In our case, we would have customer A showing they owed $100. Customer B doesn't owe anything. Customer C doesn't owe anything. Total owed by person is $100. Total balance in accounts receivable is $100. So the accounts receivable subledger, in summary, holds the individual's activity. Most of the information is brought over from the sales journal, where you pick up credit sales and the cash receipts journal where you pick up payments and those are listed daily in the subledger. We list them daily because we don't want to make credit granting decisions without knowing what the balance in the subledger is during the month. At the end of the month when the, when the journals are posted and to the general ledger and an adjusted trial balance is prepared, you can tell the general ledger is in balance when debits equal credits and you can tell the accounts receivable control account is in balance when the balance in the subledger account equals the balance in the control account. Let's look at the accounts payable subledger now.
that we looked at the accounts receivable sub-ledger in our last example. Most of the entries that come into the accounts payable sub-ledger accounts, and let's have three customers, one, two, and three, will come from our credit purchases, where we record purchases on credit, and our cash payments, where we make payments. This is where the information for the accounts payable subledger principally comes. Each day, as you fill out the purchases journal, you would record an entry into the accounts payable subledger. Getting kind of tiny there, sorry. So let's say you had two credit purchases during the month. Somewhere in the month you purchased $1,000 on credit from vendor number one, and you would record that in your purchases journal, and you purchased $5,000 on credit to, from vendor number three, and you would record that in your purchases journal. At the end of the month, you would total your purchases journal, and your credit purchases would total 6000 You would post that into the general ledger, in total. And you can again, here let's put per cash or purchases journal. Again, you can see the posting rule in effect. The sum of the credits in the subledger must equal the total credit in the accounts payable general ledger account. You would pick up the payments you had made on account from your cash payments journal every day as you were making them. Let's say you made one payment on account during the month. When you made it, you would come down. We'll say we paid $5,000 to vendor three, and you would record that payment as it happened during the month. At the end of the month, when you totaled your cash payments journal and you posted it into the general ledger accounts, accounts payable would show that debit of $5,000. Again, you can see the posting rule. The sum of the debits in the control account must equal the sum of the debits in the accounts payable subledger. Let's build in one more transaction. Let's say you had a return in your general journal to vendor number one. You returned accounts payable to vendor number one in the amount of $500, and it was for inventory. So you record the return, and at the end of the month, inventory would be debited for five, or accounts payable would be debited for $500, and inventory would be credited for 500 During the course of the month, you might be posting your accounts payable subledger hit, so you would go into your accounts payable subledger and show a return to vendor number one. Again, the posting rules in effect. You now have $5,500 worth of debits in the subledger, and that must equal the sum of the debits in the accounts payable account there would now be a $500 credit balance in accounts payable. And when you made a list at the end of the month of your accounts payable, you would show vendor number one owed $500, vendor number two owed nothing, vendor number three owed nothing, the total liability should be 500 and that agrees with the accounts payable account. The accounts receivable and accounts payable are called control accounts. And what that means is that there's a sub-ledger that is balancing to them at the end of the month. The way you know your general ledger is in balance is when your debits equal your credits. The way you know when your subledgers are in balance is when the sum
of the accounts payable or the accounts receivable balances equal the balances in the control account in the general ledger. In this way, you can keep track of who you owe money by person and by total and who you owe money to. By person and by total. It's only good accounting to know these things because if you don't know who owes you money and they think that, they may or may not be willing to pay you. And you always need to know who you need to pay money to so you can stay current on your bills. That is a review of how subsidiary ledgers fit into the accounting cycle. Hopefully that helps.